You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julian Warwick with Weekend and I have two guests with me for the rest of the programme to offer their perspectives on the news and talking points of the day. Dr Natasha Call is Associate Professor in Politics and International Relations at the Centre for the Study of Democracy based at the University of Westminster in London. She's also a novelist and her second novel, Future Tense, was published by Harper Collins in 2020. And Natasha is originally from Kashmir. Welcome, Natasha. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julian. And Oliver McTurnan is with me, co-founder and director of Forward Thinking, which is an organisation focusing on conflict resolution in the Middle East. And Oliver is in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Oliver, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Julian. Uh, a word of introduction to you both, Natasha. I described uh, your academic career and the fact that you're a novelist as well. Which which one takes up more of your time, as a rule? I think it depends on the year. Uh, there's a there's a famous line uh, from you know from an American author. There are years that that ask questions and years that answer. Um, and uh, it, it really depends. At the moment, a lot of my time is taken up by thinking about democracy and, uh, you know, with all of the things that are going on. So more academic work right now. Uh, but yes, of course, the novel coming out last year is, is something that I look forward to doing real events with real people um, at some point. Mm. We'll talk more about the, the novel a little bit later on. On the academic front, I mean, clearly uh, the one-to-one um, dealings with students will have been dramatically affected by the events of the last 18 months. How has that been for you? Uh, so actually we've returned to in-person teaching. I teach postgraduates and uh, supervise a lot of PhDs. So we, you know, we are, um, as, as an institution, I think uh, it's it's been, the way it's happening now is that it's down to institutions and to, to enforce the norms of resp- being responsible with each other. So uh, we do have Uh, this requirement that unless people have an exemption they wear masks so I I do I'm aware of the fact that a few of my colleagues in other places do have have to had this have had this difficulty of having to be in classrooms where they're not entirely comfortable if people don't have their masks on but personally I'm I'm very glad that that has not been a problem for me so far. Uh, Oliver a word about forward thinking and how it came about what's the story? Um, Alongside that of course there's the scale mm -hmm of the human catastrophe. That figure about children is astonishing. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's a humanitarian catastrophe. I have been on, you know, on this program uh, a a long while ago, and we were speaking about Mm. Yemen. And it's one of those situations that no one, it's this tragedy that no one seems to care about. You know, we have, Mm. we have Western, various Western states that support Saudi Arabia and UAE and other participants. The Muslim majority states don't care because the primary victims often are not Muslims. The other post-colonial states don't care because it suits no one's interests. So, you know, unlike Syria, where, which animated a lot of actors in the international community and then went off the radar again, I mean, of course, because the suffering didn't end, but because there was a decisive uh, kind of, you know, at least a, a, a dominance of the one side. With this impasse in this conflict, it's because no one side has the capacity for decisive victory. And yet this and, and the situation goes on. It's human cost is as your, you know, as as the person on the uh, line, as the UNICEF person just said, the, the situation, the responsibility the children have had no responsibility and their lives are 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 are, are just basically they're they're dying and being maimed and having to live under this condition it's it's uh, it, it raises the fundamental question of the worth of human life in in geopolitics and and we all should care and um and uh, it's it's the fact that it's on the ground and it's happening and you know i was really touched by uh, to to hear that there are people who haven't received their salary for the longest and they're still trying to do what they can under these very absurd circumstances where um it's it's the very definition of absurd they can't go on and yet they must go on but i just i just want there to you know i just wish my my wish today is that there be a day that i'm on this program and we're not talking about yemen and nobody has to talk about yemen and children dying in yemen because somehow it has been addressed well, uh, uh, it's it's wishful thinking but i i really honestly hope that that we can do better i suspect something a little more uplifting ahead of the news it's well you know and it's just the kind of story for these for these times that we are living in the idea of people coming together to deal with a crisis to be morally courageous to do the right thing it's uh, i was just struck by a whole lot of uh, phrases i heard with that and um it's I, I mean i haven't seen the documentary but from what i've read about it 
it's uh, you know it 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 does show the role of coming together it's a it's a it's the kind of thing that that is also made by asian filmmakers and uh, you know and they've spoken about um having consciously avoided the stereotype so it's not about some other people going in and saving them it's mm. not like you know the the westerners going in and saving the helpless people but people coming together to to make a complex operation successful and to save lives and all over that point throughout the program dr natasha call is associate professor in politics and international relations at the center for the study of democracy at the university of westminster in london uh, she is also a novelist and Oliver McTurnan is the co-founder and director of Forward Thinking which focuses on conflict resolution in the Middle East. Uh, Natasha we mentioned your second novel at the start of the program which was published last year Future Tense. What were you exploring? What themes were you looking at in that novel? So um, thank you Julian. Uh, the novel Future Tense is set in contemporary Kashmir and uh, as, as you mentioned earlier I am originally from Kashmir and i wanted to speak about the conflict through the medium of fiction to tell the stories of essentially a group of young people the characters in the book and what happens to their dreams about their lives as they are surrounded by such a vitiated atmosphere where uh, you know there's little trust there's little hope and the canvas on which they can essentially paint their dreams is very small so it basically tells their stories and uh, the kind of the 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 period so it's set in the period after the floods in kashmir the devastating floods in 2014 uh, up, up until the uh, you know a few years ago the incident of the human shield so it's mm-hmm. it's it's life in a conflict zone for young people and uh, what sorts of friendships and relationships and uh, what that does to their dreams and to how how they can or cannot trust each other uh, across identity divides and when telling those kinds of stories against a factual backdrop um how much are you planning everything that happens to each of those young people or or do do things surprise you as you write it sometimes uh you know uh, that's that's i think the beautiful uh, thing about a creative process that anyone even listening and people who who work creatively all of us recognize that there's just something that that alchemy of that process is that you think you know what you're doing based on what moves you and as you're trying to realize it other things also happen so there's this one particular character uh you know whose whose name translates really as as sort of like a bitcher is his name it's a kashmiri word it means the you know the helpless one and we we don't really know why he's helpless we think we know but then we actually find out it's for a different reason that people have given him that nickname that character just happened you know this this 13 year old boy with a limp in his leg just happened um and uh he's he's actually one of my favorite characters in the book i i didn't plan him hmm. well let's though no, well, tasha where do you stand i i actually agree with uh with oliver and with this idea that uh, you know we're 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 it this is a complex issue it is about the trade off between individual and uh, you know wider rights but we are we are interdependent as as beings in as social beings and uh, you know a, a vaccine is the uh, this kind of a thing is the perfect example of a negative or a positive externality where one person being vaccinated or not could actually have an effect on everyone else and uh, and i do think that uh, you know while not ideal there are situations where there where if for some reason due to misinformation or for any other reason there's a lot of resistance then people have to be convinced and uh, and in in cases where they have to directly interact with vulnerable people uh, i i think that it's uh, for me i think it's a, it's a tough call but i would say yes uh, uh, the, if looked at as well that that notion of of people following that conspiracy theory now looking to get into the political mainstream is a very interesting one isn't it yes and you know the the saddest com- this is partly of course fueled uh, by by social media and by the technologies and the kinds of uh, collaborations they've made possible in the especially in the last decade um but as from trump and trumpism has has shown us this is it wasn't a blip i mean the appeal of this kind of package of prejudices uh is is quite strong for large numbers of people uh it's you know and and uh, in in the us i mean it shows something about the state of the republican party that as a mainstream party that it's lead, you know that there are people of the party who are going to speak at such conferences i think for the longest time it's also been the case that very often media coverage of such you know in, in at least in the initial years of such um of such groups 
uh, was not responsible enough you know it was uh, i feel like um, sometimes uh, the explanations also ended up legitimizing those those groups by saying well you know they have these they say they have these grievances and perhaps they do rather than paying more attention to the processes through which the grievance narratives and the conspiracy kind of networks get get established and uh, you know and how they enroll people into that particular understanding okay. and i'm glad that now you know everyone takes this whole idea of of tackling uh, misinformation and and this kind of um of pernicious um collaboration and and um more seriously because Indeed. because it is dangerous and costs lives natasha cole and oliver mcturn and my guest i think sorry natasha Oh, I, I, sorry, I didn't know I was hurt. Um, yes, I, I do want to, you know, just uh, kind of echo and, and emphasize all the points, uh, all, all these points that Oliver has been making as well, mm. that, you know, in whatever be the outcome of this particular trial, in, in the, you know, in the court of defense and historical memory, these instances where people are being let, you know, are being intentionally let to, you know, let to die, left to die, is is no different than when we look back two centuries ago and we think of enslavement and we think of say you know a, a ship like the zong in 1783 people being thrown over broke board and the, the enslaved and thinking how could they have done that how could they have enslaved people and treated them like objects and put that in double entry bookkeeping you know in as, as objects two here 200 years on from now people will look back and think how could they have let year after year boats after boats of people fleeing desperate circumstances just die like this this it does not make any sense and it's so systematic i mean if you think of where the wars are you think of where enslavement was you think of where the vaccine vaccines aren't you think of where the refugees are from it you know in terms of latitude and longitude it, it maps on pretty well so uh, these I, are, are very structural issues that i think that you know politicians make political capital out of in a short term with anti-immigrant rhetoric and you know demonizing the refugees but it, it also uh, you know enables all kinds of other dehumanizations inside our boundaries because when you know they are the absolute other but then they are the poor within uh, national boundaries there are other kinds of vulnerable people and it's it's basically that that indifference that apathy that anesthesia to, to human suffering i, I hear uh, i hear the, i hear the passion in both and natasha briefly off on this if you would i mean it was interesting that oliver raised the the, the story of alan kurdi uh, and mm. people's attitudes did seem to change at that point and of course earlier on he was comparing the attitude to the young lads caught in the cave in Thailand mm, with the mm. huge numbers of people who've been killed in Yemen. Is it the case that when the numbers become so big but you can't identify the individuals, that people's attitudes are different? Uh, well, yes, uh, there is that aspect of the, the mediatization of the spectacular image mm. that sticks in people's minds, uh, as opposed to this kind of, you know, what, uh, what, what in a scholarly sense, this kind of, you know, people have called this anonymous corporeality, these bodies, the mass of bodies without names, without stories, without identities. And, and that people think of as, you know, that just gets banalized. Now, politicians do this kind of thing because they can. But I think this is why people need to think, uh, you know, need, this is why education is important. People need to think, to be able to think critically and, uh, you know, um, kind of in um, in challenge to, to be able to counter this rhetoric in their heads because okay. human beings are not by nature indifferent to other people's suffering. That is a learned response. The idea that we should not care requires a lot of work to, to get that into people's heads that you don't care when when I think our our first instinct of, of most people anywhere is to care. My guest uh, Natasha Cole, similar um, backdrop mm. um, earlier on. Did those kinds of emotions come through you as well? Uh, yes, it, a, a lot of uh, what I heard resonated with me. Uh, this idea of, uh, you know, conflict divides communities along lines of identity. And uh, there is the question of the state and, and the overwhelming amount of violence that is used. There are kind of spectacular instances that play, play a role. So for me, you know, this idea of a person being tied to the front of a jeep being used as a human shield was this image I couldn't get out of my head. Um, writing, I think, you know, writing about conflict, uh, in, in, as I imagine in that novel too, is, is sort of like a resistance that we offer via the medium of, of memory to the officialness of history, if, if that makes sense. You know, it's like we're trying to speak against what we are, what is known about uh, a story in order to say, well, there, there's a lot more here that happened. 
Um, I, I don't know if I entirely agree with the idea that, you know, that we, though we cannot change the past, of course, and the lives that are lost, we perhaps can change the, perhaps fiction and, and such narratives can change the way people think about them. So in that sense, I think even when as an author, we, someone might want to think that, you know, it's not a political novel or it's not about politics i think it somehow inescapably gets seen as political it cannot really escape politics because of the way people look to the book to be telling of the story of the people and and how you know there's almost this burden of identity that one carries and this uh this kind of pressure almost to be the voice uh in that sense i mean i think that um that that yes i mean it's uh, writing about conflict i think is is for me uh, this act of memory, this fundamentally an act of memory, but also something that is political. You're listening to Weekend. Briefish thoughts from you both ahead of the news, which is two minutes away. This will forever, Natasha, be such a controversial issue, won't it? Uh, I really want to first of all say the efforts and uh, struggles of women's groups in order to get this uh, are important to recognize. The fact that resistance to it remains is not surprising because rights like this cannot be taken for granted, as we know from Texas. Uh, politics over women's bodies uh, is something that, you know, it's impossible for, for us to imagine the counterfactual of how it would be if it were men in that place. The punitive attitudes towards uh, the simple idea of my body, my rights is something that we still find in the 21st century. Uh, I will say also that this is not just a conservative and a Catholic or no, a religious not. thing. Uh, even even left wing populist president in, the, in in Mexico has branded the feminist movement as an enemy. So I I mean I would say and you know I've I've kind of worked on this quite a bit, including publishing earlier in this year. This idea of you know misogynist authoritarianism that we now see in contemporary democracies, this legitimization of feminizing of of kind of othering uh, you know kind of dismissing women's rights and not taking it seriously enough or punishing women when they speak up is is just uh, you know it's it's just should be completely unacceptable uh, oliver highlighting natasha called the the challenges facing so many people in authority wherever they are in the world as the climate continues to behave ever more erratically yes absolutely i mean i think we are we everyone should recognize that uh, in in the decades to come climate change and ecological uh, you know disasters um, will will become something that we will have to contend with mitigate learn from and uh, and do better i mean the thing about kerala is you see i mean it's a place very dear to me I, i've written about kerala I've, you know I'm, I, so when i was listening to your correspondent describe the devastation in in front of my eyes i had the scenes of of you know kerala is like a sem- symphony in green it's such a beautiful place and uh, you know within india and in the, in the kind of all the brochures it's called uh, god's own country and to imagine that destruction and the thing is it it hasn't just happened this year the floods in kerala have for in in previous years to taken lives and they've you know they've happened again and again and of course the environmental aspect cannot be addressed uh, directly or easily but there are questions around you know what can what can be done in terms of implementing the reports of the various committees that have in previous years been given to you know to address things that can be addressed such as you know stone quarrying mining um, you know res- z- uh, silting in reservoirs things like that that can be addressed and and all too often when something like this happens and lives are lost and the floods are in the news at least you know from from within that uh, domestic sense it kind of gets covered uh, in the media as something between the government and opposition it's the government's fault and you know uh, and it, like like politics runs in in very many places but fundamentally it it is something that especially in a state like kerala where you know there are there are all kinds of complexities at at very grassroots level with with structures and networks like of clientelism etc which might make making some of these changes hard but kerala has had decentralized participatory planning for the longest time it's you know it's a state with better health and education and awareness uh, so it should be possible to to you know to not have this happen year after year with loss of life at least um, and, and oliver as that has been lacking here Mm. I mean, uh, you know, I think the um, the other, the, the, you know, the other thing is we live in a world of competing tragedies and all too often it's un- understood as if if we care about one, then we can't care about the other. 
but actually uh, the root causes of many of these conflicts are around you know geopolitical narratives that are interlinked so uh, with syria of course there was more attention because you know as i as i said uh, you know with with syria it's it's the fact that one side was dominant even if not completely victorious uh, whereas in yemen there is no capacity for decisive victory and there are entrenched perceptions now the thing is to to change this to you know with conflicts that keep going on to create the pressures there needs to be change in narratives and as you know as we've been talking about this the that needs to happen through how people think about this but also globally i mean there are powerful actors and sure there's not a hierarchy but there is a hierarchy there are different pathways and lever- you know leverages that can be uh, can be used to bring people to care as as of now you know it's not a place with oil it's not a place where where i any you know post colonial or muslim majority states or or regional actors or western states no one actually cares as much so i don't need to, you know i don't know who needs to hear this but one thing that i do want to kind of emphasize underline and italicize is the point made by the unicef person that you know whoever you know that that money that that unicef was asking for uh you know in the larger scheme of things as he said it's it's nothing okay. but it makes a material difference to people's lives so so i think that uh, you know in terms of that from from the point of view of the children whose life lives need saving we need to keep talking about this if that is all we can do we need to still say that um uh, something needs to be done we must end the conversation there sadly because uh, the program has come to its natural end thank you both very much natasha call oliver mcturnan